Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In today's video we are going to look at how cube maps are created and displayed using the editor. We start in texture.cs where I added a type alias for the three-dimensional array of slices. This is so that we don't have to type list of list of list of slices every time a method needs a parameter of this type. Here we use this extension method for comparing floating point values. And then I added three new properties to the texture import settings. The cube map size, mirror cube map, and pre-filter cube map, which as you probably already know will be implemented in the next episode. We also save and load the new settings. And here are the default values set in the constructor. As we saw at the start of the video, we can now use this type alias instead of the nested list type. That was everything that was changed or added to this file. Let's have a look at content tools api.cs next. I updated this error message since we can now create cube maps from equirectangular images. The new settings are also added here. This is a structure that is sent to the C++ importer. Here we get the values from the texture import settings. I removed a few unnecessary namespaces and used the slice array 3D type here as well. In get texture info, I moved up the flag property in order to set its value first because some other properties could determine their value depending on the flags. For example, the format name is different when a texture is marked as sRGB. This order dependency is not a great practice and I don't really like it, but it will have to do for now. The only remaining changes in this file are again using the type alias and removing namespaces. Next is the texture editor, where we display the cube maps. In order to be able to display all six faces of a cube map at the same time, I added a new class with a bitmap image for each face. We also remember which MIP level is displayed and what array index the cube map starts at. Then I added two new properties. The first one refers to an instance of the cube map class if the texture is a cube map. The second one determines if the cube map should be displayed as an unwrapped cube or as one single face at a time. I added a new method in order to set the cube map property. We call this method when the selected bitmap is set. It doesn't do anything if the current texture is not a cube map. A new instance of cube map class is constructed from the slice bitmaps data and assigned to the cube map property if the cube map property hasn't been set, or the current index is different from the cube map index, or the selected MIP level changed. When the bitmaps are regenerated, we also reset the cube map property, so it will be updated with the new bitmaps. As you might remember, we have a file system watcher that detects file changes within the content folder and updates the registered assets according to those changes. Saving an asset without temporarily turning off the file system watcher will sometimes cause the asset registry to try and read the file before it's done saving. This will throw an exception and fail to both register and display the new file in the content browser. In order to prevent that from happening, I created an extension method which must be called instead of directly saving the asset file. I put it in helpers.cs and as you can see, it disables the file system watcher before saving the asset. Regardless of whether it was successful or not, it will re-enable the file watcher upon return. We use this method in primitive mesh dialog as well. On another note, I was using the wrong property for sliders with discrete tick frequency. I was using interval, which is not the right one to use. It should be tick frequency. So I changed this in all places where it was happening. Next, we have texture import settings view, where I based the text block style on the light text block style and set its color to a dimmer gray when it is disabled. This is needed for disabled settings. 
Then we have a stack panel that contains import settings that are only enabled when the texture is being imported as a cube map. These settings are the cube map size, mirror cube map, and pre filter cube map. Note that we can't set cube map size when pre filter cube map is true. Let me also show you what this looks like. Here we have the three new settings, and this section might be laid out differently depending on the width of the panel. I added a little margin here and also here. In Geometry Editor view, there's the same fix as I did for other sliders. And in Texture Details view, I fixed the typo. Then we look at Texture Editor view, where I changed the Design Time height and set the Design Time visibility for the Alpha button. Here's the button for toggling between Cube Map view and Single Image view. It's only visible when the texture is indeed a cube map. And there are three more slider fixes. Visualizing the cube map happens in the texture view. I added this namespace so that we can use a converter that I'm going to show in a minute. So this user control was at first rather simple, displaying a single image. I added quite a bit of XAML code in order to display cube maps. Here we have the converter I was talking about. It calculates the reciprocal of any value that we provide. In the converter's code, we can see that it simply returns 1 divided by the value. Its normal function checks if the number is a non zero number that's not infinity. Note that the convertBack method does the same calculation. Another converter that we're going to need is ArrayIndex to CubeFace converter. It takes a number and calculates its modulo with 6, which will return a number between 0 and 5. This converter is in the code behind of texture view, where I also added this if statement to prevent a divide by 0 that can happen when the texture is loaded but the image is not set yet, so actual width and actual height could be 0. Going back to texture view, I defined the channel select effect as a resource in contrast to how it was before as we see in the removed code block. We still have an image that's only visible when we want to view a single slice at a time. As before, it uses the selected slice bitmap as its source. However, now instead of defining the channel select effect directly, it uses the static resource. Next, I added a default path style which will apply to the highlighting arrows. As we'll see in a minute, each arrow is simply a path control. Actually, most of this XAML code is for handling the little arrows that appear when a different slice is selected. Let me show you what I mean by this. Here we see the created cube map, and using the layer slider, we can highlight each face. I chose to fade out the arrows so that they are not in the way when we are inspecting the texture. They could be especially noticeable when we zoom out like so. Also note that no matter what the zoom level is, the size of the arrows remains the same. That's done using this scale transform, which is bound to the scale factor and uses the reciprocal converter to reverse the zoom level for these arrows. As we'll see in a bit, each face of the cube map is placed within a grid that has 3 rows and 4 columns. I added a grid style in order to set grid row and grid column attached properties for the arrows depending on which slice has been selected. This converter is used to calculate the corresponding face index as we saw earlier. So for each index between 0 and 5, the arrows are placed in the grid accordingly. We also have an event trigger that starts an animation every time a property is updated. It will only get triggered for property bindings for which we set notify on target updated to true. Using this mechanism, whenever the array index is changed, it will start the animation which changes the opacity of the arrows to become fully opaque and therefore visible. Since the auto reverse is set to true, it will animate the opacity to fully transparent, fading out the arrows. As I mentioned, the cube map faces are put in a 3x4 grid. 
We use one image for each face and depending on the face we set the grid properties in order to place it where it belongs. Note also that we use the channel effect resource. The highlighting arrows are added on top and as you can see we use the grid style for their placement and visibility. The layout transform makes sure that their size is calculated using this scale transform. And here we see the path definition for the four arrows. As a final resource we have a data template where there are two content presenters, one for single image view and one for the cube map view. If the texture is a cube map and view as cube map property is true, then the content presenter for single image view is collapsed and the one for viewing the cube map is made visible. The content of the border is another content presenter that shows this data template if the view model is a texture editor. I use the content presenter instead of putting this grid directly in the border in order to prevent binding errors. This way all data is loaded when the control tries to bind to the properties. These were all changes in this file which I am going to show you again. And that's everything I added to the editor in order to create and display cube maps. By the way, I upgraded to .NET 8. Since we are using .NET 8, we can use a new language feature to simplify the code a little bit. Let me try to find the thing I'm looking for. Ok, here we see this expression where we take a parameter x and do something with it. This is rather common in C Sharp and the new language feature eliminates the need for typing the parameter name every time. So we can simply just type rename and it will be called for the parameter x. We can also choose to apply this to the entire project or even the entire solution. When I press apply to project, it will find all occurrences of this expression and simplify them. We can see that now we have got a few more modified files. Note that we don't have to have a parameter in order for it to work. It works the same for parameterless lambda expressions as you can see here. And that concludes episode 72 of the Game Engine programming series. In summary, we added the ability to convert equirectangular images to cube maps, which can be done on both CPU or GPU. This is an addition to using six different images from which a cube map can also be created. The resulting cube maps can now be viewed as an unwrapped cube in the texture editor, where we can also use new settings in order to control how the cube map is created. In the next episode, we are going to look at how environment cube maps can be used as a global light source, which is a technique that's known as image-based lighting. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode and if you'd like to recommend this series to others, it's as simple as pressing the like and subscribe buttons and letting YouTube do the recommendations for you. And you would have my biggest thanks. As always, thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next time.